Well, welcome back. Uh, good afternoon. Hopefully buddy, everybody enjoyed their lunch. I was thinking a lot this, about all of the things we heard this morning, and one of the things that resonated with me had to do with measurement. I don't know if anybody realized that pretty much every topic that was discussed this morning has something to do with measurement. Certainly safety is built around measurement. We talked about productivity, that was built around measurement. Um, even the financial, uh, the little bit of financial that we heard about had something to do with measurement. And then certainly the last session before lunch had a lot to do about measurement. Well, we, we're here to try to get quality into that discussion. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna take you on a journey. We're gonna take you on a journey where the destination is to make quality measurable. But before we can start that journey, we need to explain or give you some insight into why we actually started this journey. You may recognize some of these quality failures, uh, many of which are you know, recent history. Uh, some of them had tragic consequences, unfortunately. There's the Herman Tower in Las Vegas where the structure couldn't support its own weight. There's the Hubble telescope that was launched with improperly polished mirrors. There's the big dig where some of the tunnels experienced leakage. Then there's the, the, uh, the bridge collapse in Minneapolis, and sadly, the Challenger disaster due to failed O-rings. It's quality failures like these and many others that have been uh, re you know, noticed throughout the industry that keep CII focused on looking for ways to uh, develop, a, you know, looking for ways to measure quality. The hope is, the idea is that like safety has adequately demonstrated that if you measure something, you can improve it. That's where RT313 came in. We're here to talk about how to measure quality. This is kind of an overview of the journey we're gonna to take today. From today's approach where we basically look at quality events, we record them, we report them, and then we react to them individually. We wanna to go to where we can measure quality performance, analyze that, uh, the data that we get by measuring it, and then use that analysis to improve our quality processes, with the ultimate goal, of course, to reduce the number of quality events and the severity of quality events. So in order to start this journey, we had to look at what are the key weaknesses in our current quality practices? What is it that we have to be aware of in order to develop a process for measuring quality? So when we looked at organizations across the industry, we noticed a couple things that were pretty significant if you want to measure quality. One is there's inconsistent quality requirements as you go between organizations. Currently, we can't really tread the quality uh, performance internally and certainly not across the industry, and we cannot benchmark quality performance, uh, typically internally or, and, and definitely not across the industry. So we had to look at what would, we, what would we need to overcome these weaknesses and put us on a path to where we could actually measure quality. Uh, first and foremost, we need a common language. Everybody has to be, have a common understanding of what quality is and what quality performance is and what quality events are. We have to have a common scalable metric. And the reason scalable is important is if you look across the industry, you'll see we have organizations that are various sizes and complexities, and they execute projects uh, of various sizes and complexities. So we need to have a metric that's usable by everyone. And this metric has to be capable of supporting trending, and then ultimately, although we understand it won't happen immediately, uh, benchmarking. The other thing that was important is we had to have a work process that would allow us to use the available quality management system processes that are in place. And any data that we needed would have to be easy to collect. And the reason for this is that we don't want to burden uh, organizations with additional work if we can avoid it, if we really expect them to implement this, this process. So we were, we were focused on, on those three things. So with that background, we're going to ask Subash to kind of start our journey for us. Subash. Thank you, Cal. All aboard. 
we are going to take you on a train ride to measuring quality, measuring quality performance. Uh, talking about a train ride, I live in Los Angeles. You know, the city with crowded freeways? But we have train, too. So one day, when my wife decided that we're going to go from LA County to deep into Orange County taking the train, I went along with that idea. Since this was my first time uh, on the trains in Los Angeles, I was kind of noticing the train stations as they were going by. I noticed that uh, Anaheim Stadium uh, is at Anaheim Station, then the big uh, Santa Ana Station, then followed Irvine, then Laguna Niguel. On the way back, when we hopped onto the train again, I again wanted to make sure that I'm going in the right direction, so I checked to make sure, yeah, the Irvine came, then Santa Ana, and I must have dozed off for, because I knew I was going in the right direction. And I heard Anaheim Canyon on the PS system, so I looked outside, and there was no Angel Stadium. So we were on the wrong track. Well, we're not going to let that happen to you. So what we have arranged is a ticket that you need, and common language is the ticket, and I'm going to go over that a little bit more. The train you'll be traveling on is quality metric or common metric, and the track you'll be on is the common work process. And now the common work process is also gonna give you a map so you know you're gonna travel in the right direction. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about common language because that becomes the basis for all the future measurements. Now the terms you see on the screen are the quality terms that you all know. Everybody has a quality plan implemented in their system. And, sorry. And you have a quality plan, you have total quality management, quality assurance, quality control, Six Sigma, all of these activities. These are, this is a quality management system that's basically a prevention-based system. The idea behind the prevention-based system is you have Work, you have worked out the procedures, the plans uh, that you have implemented across your company to make sure that the deliverable quality meets the customer expectations. So we have now rolled that into a pyramid, and the, and the foundation of the pyramid is the prevention-based quality management system. And the next level is the appraisal process. Once you implement it, you have to start appraising it, and appraisal is through audits, surveillances, um, inspections, tests. Again, um, some of the reviews also, HAZOP reviews or peer reviews or verification reviews, they're part of that. And uh, this is usually, these are planned activities, and we call them leading indicators. But um, this is basically a level of effort. And the level of effort is contingent upon the scope of work and the risk level that you want to manage. And the top four are the un unplanned events. Findings, variations, defects, and failures. These are the unplanned events. Um, you, we've used them in the past. We used them in the management review of our quality management system. And we've used that information to fine tune your quality management system but through plans and processes. But we're going to use these to, to measure quality, and I'll show you how. And by the way, if you notice it, the top four, they look pretty much familiar with, uh, you, if you're familiar with the safety pyramid. And we're using that successful formula that the safety pyramid has. Now, the safety pyramid and the quality pyramid, the commonalities, you'll notice it. But the, one of the commonalities uh, once the severity level goes up, up the level of the pyramid, the severity level goes up. Now, these are the, the terms and definitions that we have developed are based on findings, variation, defects, and failure. They, uh, they become the common language. That's the paradigm shift. You need to understand what these definitions are, so when you are implementing the quality measurement process, you'll be able to implement it properly and get the results that you want to get. For example, I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you the uh, unplanned outcome, which is, first one is findings. Findings are a result of, a, of an assurance process or um, 
appraisal process. Through the reviews and uh, audits and surveillances, they identify what the uh, project staff is implementing and are they implementing the appropriate procedures and plans that have been approved for the, by the system. And this is kind of a one-time or a stitch-in-time type of in effect that the findings have. Now, if you correct them on time, you'll be able to control or reduce the unplanned events. But if not, and once you start measuring it, make sure you take advantage of that and make sure you are measuring the effect of findings on what kind of an effect it has on, on unplanned events, which are variations, defects, and failures. And you'll be surprised. There is a correlation, and you need to find that out. The next is variations. Each variation is basically evaluated by the design team and approved based on the scope of work and based on the risk levels that you can take. So in, in some cases, the um, stakeholders are also involved in the review. So it has a wide exposure to it. People are aware of it, what decisions are being made. So that's the first one we track. The second one are the defects. Now these are whenever you don't meet the requirements of the specifications, you identify them. They have a definite impact on cost and schedules. So when the defects are uncovered, you have to stop work, you have to get it corrected, and that basically interrupts the workflow. So it has, a, it has an effect on, on the overall process and how you implement it. And if you start doing trend analysis or causal analysis of these defects, sure, you can go ahead and do that. All they're going to point is you didn't implement, implement your quality management system the way it was supposed to be. So it's too late at this stage. You just have to get it corrected and move on. But up to now, you have control over all the work that you're doing, and you're making sure that the product, when it leaves your, your company or your, your project, is acceptable to the customer and goes on to the customer. But these defects become failures once they go to the customer, and they uncover these problems. Now, the, the examples that you see here, the ruptured vessel and the pump, these sometimes are warranty issues. So they get fixed, but some of the severity of the failures could be uh, impact on stock price, unwanted publicity, uh, sometimes loss of life. Now, you can't live with those things. So the failure becomes uh, a big problem for a company to manage. <clears throat> Once you understand these definitions and you start plotting them and adding them and get, getting the information, now you're really ready to get on the metric train. I'm going to invite Robert Reese, who is, he and the academic team consisting of Tim Needy and, and the students that helped us, made sure we stayed on the train and got to the final destination of measuring quality performance. Robert? Thank you, Subhash. Now that uh, Subhash has punched our ticket for the journey, I'll describe the common metric, which is basically the train that will take us to our destination. The quality performance rate is the sum of unplanned quality events, variations, defects, and failures multiplied by their respective severity levels and normalized by 200,000 labor hours. 200,000 labor hours was chosen as a normalization factor because it mirrors the safety metrics normalization and is therefore easy for organizations to implement and to use. An organization would implement the quality performance rate by mapping their quality event data to the appropriate level in the quality pyramid. Each, uh, uh, each phase of a project can have its own quality performance rate from front end loading through detail design, construction, startup commissioning, and turnover, as well as an overall quality performance rate for a project. So organizations can calculate cumulative QPR for each project, and they can also trend and compare 
cumulative QPR for projects across their organization. Eventually, we'll be able to have cumulative QPR for the industry as a whole and start to compare and trend that. Once QPR is sufficiently used by industry, we'll be able to establish some baselines and benchmarks so that QPR can be compared and trended across organizations in the industry. This is similar to the journey taken by safety metrics since the formative years of OSHA in the, in the 1970s. RT313 recognizes that each event at a given level in the quality pyramid may have a different level of severity. So the team put together a severity model that includes safety, project cost, and project schedule. The early adopters in our project team were surveyed to provide some guidance for organizations that are implementing the QPR so that we can get some consistency across organizations. In terms of safety, any quality event that has a safety impact would have a high severity. Project cost and project schedule have three levels, low, medium, and high. For example, for project cost, if a project, uh, if a quality event's cost impact is between 0.1% and 0.75% of total project cost, we would classify that as a medium severity quality event. If the quality event is greater than 0.75%, that would be considered a high impact quality event. This guidance will provide some uh, consistency across organizations. The severity scale was established so that as you go up on the quality pyramid in terms of quality events, the severity increases. Having a severity weighting is important for the assessment and interpretation of the quality data and will help in the continuous improvement for organizations. I'll now pass it back to Cal who will continue our journey with the common work processes. Thank you, Robert. You know, now that Robert's kind of introduced you to the train that should carry us to our destination and Savash has kind of punched your ticket, uh, it's important for us to look at the last piece of this and that's the tracks that'll make sure the train arrives at the destination we intended. And that's our common work process. If you look at our work process, you'll see it's a four step procedure. It's really my intent to introduce this procedure at a very high level uh, for, this, uh, for this presentation with the idea that the implementation resource has a very detailed workflow map that will lay out the detail that you're not gonna hear uh, from me. The other thing we're going to do uh, within this part is to, uh, within this section of the presentation, is, is to allow the three uh, early adopter companies that are up on stage with us uh, to give us a brief uh, overview of some of their experience in actually implementing uh, this research. So that of course takes us to the first step, which really is a value uh, statement. This is where the companies need to think about their current processes, the maturity of their quality management systems, and the cost that might be incurred by them, and, and really assess that against the benefits that we understand or we believe that this uh, uh, measuring quality will will uh, uh, achieve for them. And what you see in those bubbles up on the screen are basically the major benefits that we think can come out of this, uh, out of this uh, research. So again, a, a cost, a quantitative cost benefit analysis early in the, in the process will be very difficult. It'll, it'll take some use of the, uh, or some attempted use of the, of the metric to get a real feel for what, the, uh, what a true value uh, might be. So with that, we're going to, before we go to step two, we're gonna ask Jerry Burke from Zachary to give us a brief, uh, some brief feedback relative to Zachary's experience in implementing our research. Jerry? All right. Thanks, Cal. At Zachary, we have been tracking quality versus, uh, for a number of years, and we've been tracking it by the number of inspections we made versus the number of rejections that we found. Now, what we also discovered is we didn't have a method to to report quality at a high level, that we did not include a normalization process, 
nor did we include severity levels to our reporting. So when senior management would see our reports, if we had to tighten a structural steel bolt another eighth of an inch or an eighth of a turn, or if we had to repair a heavy wall weld, they wouldn't know the difference because our reporting structure had them both equal. So when we would sit down with, with upper management and go over quality, uh, they said, you know, give us something that we could, we could understand and use. Uh, let us see some trending. Uh, tell us what the benchmarks are. Tell us what the severity rating is on these events. I need to know when I should pick up the phone and call a project manager that day or whenever I can just discuss the report with him uh, later on in the month when I, when I see him for my monthly report. So we did that. We implemented RT313 on a project. And when we sat down with senior management and showed them the way we were capturing the data now versus the way we were, they said, this is exactly what we've been wanting. Something that we can understand, something that would tell me when I have a problem or whenever I have a small problem. And then the direction was to implement the application on all of our projects. So what we've done is we're working with our IT group and we're developing a web-based application of the RT313 where we can report out uh, to senior management all the projects together. And then our plan is to roll that into other divisions and then of course across the enterprise as our, as our virtual reality. We believe that uh, RT313 does have value for Zachary. We uh, are going to continue to define how we use it in-house, and then, again, we're going to roll it out across the enterprise as our big plan. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. This, of course, brings us to step two. Step two is all about going back through all of your data sources that are available within your QMS system evaluating whether you believe that those are adequate or appropriate or to support uh, something like the QPR, or if you need to add things or modify uh, your sources. And then you would map your, co your common processes to, to um, using our common language and then really begin to collect the data. It's actually uh, as simple as that. This is just another way of showing that. So you'll see that you look at the organization QMS data, whether it's existing or new, you map it through our common language and into one of the seven event categories that support the quality performance rate. This table is a, one table that was developed by our uh, early adopters uh, to map against the defects uh, quality category. And you'll notice that if you look at the list of data sources, you'll notice that some of them only map to the pre-construction phase of a project some of them map to only the construction phase of a project, and then there's, some, there's a few that map to both. Every organization will be able to develop a similar set of maps uh, for their, based on their quality management system and, and the sources of data, you know, the sources of quality data that they have available. Before we go to the third step of our process or procedure, we're gonna ask William Tyrell of Eli Lilly to give us a brief feedback of Eli Lilly's experience with implementing you, our research. Um, I actually warned my team before I got up here, I said, if I'm gonna blank out, I'm just gonna say, I thought this was a realtor conference and just walk away. So luckily, uh, you know, being involved with this team for as long as I have, and I really believe in the work we're doing, it's just easy for me to provide testimonial. So I'm um, responsible for construction quality assurance at Eli Lilly and company. And we're early adopters of the RT313 QPR process. Now, at Eli Lilly and Company, we uh, seek to drive a quality culture that's really focused on uh, process improvement. And this is, helps us to ensure that we're providing safe, reliable, and effective medicines to all our patients. Okay, so um, our business processes, we're, we try to really optimize them, uh, reduce quality uh, issues, increase quality, uh, eliminate non-value added activities, rework, and um, provide pro good information that we can, um, that is actionable, that we can really do something with. So uh, when we first got involved with uh, RT313, we immediately saw that uh, this was a thorough way of collecting our quality data, a, a lot better than what we have in place. Presently what we do, we have 
data that we pull from our quality um, database, our, qual our construction quality database, and uh, put it out. We have about four categories that we we uh, that we collect our data from, and we easily map them into what we have with uh, the QPR. Now. Um, this wasn't an onerous process by any by any means. It was very quick for us to transition from what we were doing to what we're uh, to what we're doing now. Um, we we actually are very early in our journey with this, uh, but we see it as a great tool to work with our uh, project managers to help them evaluate the cost of quality on on their overall project cost and the impact on their schedule. Um, the, the 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 actual business uh, proposition is you know, really, truly understanding the uh, impact of negative quality events on our bottom line. So, thank you. Thanks, William. So this brings us to the third step of our procedure. It's basically where now that you've started to collect the data, you categorize the data into the various uh, event categories, finding variation defect and failure. Using the QPR, you can now calculate your quality performance rate. Once you have your quality performance rate, you can now start doing the analysis that we've talked about. Comparing projects, performance, trending performance within a project or across projects. And we, and we believe that ultimately, uh, with some maturity, data sharing, et cetera, that we can get to the point where we can uh, benchmark quality as well. This is, uh, I'm gonna provide you just a couple examples of how we've uh, been able to use this data this, uh, this is two projects from one of our early adopters, Project A and Project B, uh, where we've plotted the uh, quality performance rate across time. You'll notice that when the two projects start, um, that the QPR is very similar to, to each other. But over time, uh, Project B or Project A takes a, it starts to develop much higher QPRs than the Project B. Uh, as it turns out, Project B had, or Project A, sorry, had significantly more quality events uh, associated with it. The other thing that you might or not notice on the chart uh, is that, that if you look at Project B, you'll see that Project B initially started to show a downward trend in quality performance, but over time, the quality performance rate started to creep up. With this kind of data in front of you, it's, it's more ready, you can more readily start to ask those important questions as to why that's happening. This is kind of a, this is an illustration of another analysis that can be done to kind of stretches the QPR a little bit. Early in our research, we kind of postulated that if, if we were experiencing a lot of findings, it would, might be an indication that the organization has a robust quality program or a quality management system. So we thought it would be useful to collect the findings, generate a QPR just for findings. The beauty, one of the flexibilities in our QPR is that not only do you have to calculate it based on the uh, accumulation of variations, defects, and fi uh, failures, but you can also uh, calculate QPR for any one of those type of events. So we chose to de develop a QPR for findings and compare it to our overall Q uh, QPR to see if it actually demonstrated any kind of relationship, with the expectation being if the QPR for findings was higher, then the QPR should actually be lower, if it's true that a robust quality program helps. Now, as you can see, it does kind of show that relationship. However, we, we have to caution that uh, our data collection is very preliminary, so by no means could we, could we tell you that, yeah, just having a robust quality program will uh, minimize your quality effects or reduce your uh, quality events. Uh, but it is an interesting relationship. So uh, before we go to the final phase, we're gonna ask our final early adopter, Karen Boswell from Dow, to give us a little feedback on Dow's experience. Thanks, Gail. Dow Chemical was a part of the research team and then became an early adopter. In parallel with the research team, Dow did have a focused effort on improving the quality of our engineering deliverables. And this was done, the engineering quality was measured using construction field change orders. And this metric did drive improvements and it showed opportunities. And it was with this success that we were looking to measure quality earlier and throughout the project life cycle. And the quality performance rate, the QPR, presented through RT313, actually gave us the opportunity, the methodology to do so. The QPR, the common quality language, was adopted by our inspections department, construction quality, and engineering. 
So this really strengthened our quality metric for project teams. When we first implemented the QPR, we did not have the severity in the metric. And this made it difficult to compare the quality from project to project. We would look at the QPR per defect, per failure. Uh, with the severity scale in the metric, it really did improve, and we could then see a separation of the QPR from the projects based upon the severity of the quality events. As we implemented the QPR, we identified our work processes, and then we mapped them. In our first data collection, we actually, re in looking at our data, we had some projects or some of our work projects that gave us a lot of data. Um, some gave us many faults and defects. And then there were some that had minimal data, which is actually surprising. Both of these data sets actually gave us some opportunity. And so today, actually, we have a pilot on one of those work processes where we actually improved the efficiency of the work process. And actually, that's improving its implementation and use by smaller projects. And the other project that had the higher, or the work process that had the higher defects now has a cross-functional chartered team um, better to address those issues. Move, moving forward, we are continuing to drive quality, and obviously the measuring system is very important to be able to do that. We are learning our, we are using all of our learnings from the quality performance rate, and we are continuing to drive quality forward. Thanks, Cal. Oh, thanks, Karen. So this brings us to our fourth and final uh, step of our procedure, and this is the step that actually demonstrates the value of the of the research. This is where you've taken, now that you've done, the, you've done the measuring, you've done some analysis, this is where you can now get into causal analysis. And using causal analysis, we can, we can drive towards corrective actions and change uh, in our work processes with the, with, again, with the goal to reduce uh, the number of quality events and the severity of quality events. So now that we've introduced you to our common language, our common metric, and our common work process, I think it's fair to ask the question, did this research actually address those key weaknesses that we identified early, early in this uh, presentation? And will it help drive us to our destination of being able to effectively manage, uh, measure quality? So we obviously believe that it does. We believe that it provides a solid foundation, one that we recognize will take some use and some sharing of data across the industry to actually get to our ultimate goals of being able to benchmark quality across the industry and use it effectively across the industry. But we're convinced that uh, the quality, the QPR in our common language will drive consistent quality requirements. Events, quality events will be more readily analyzed and should help us to prevent uh, future quality events at least and reduce the severity of quality events. The process utilizes existing QMS systems. We've, we've been able to find a way to minimize burden to uh, the organizations within the industry, which was a big uh, plus for us. Um, the QPR will allow us to compare projects, both internally and then ultimately across the industry. And uh, certainly the QPR will allow us to trend quality uh, in uh, performance internally to organizations and then ultimately across the industry. And then ultimately, we, we consider that we'll be able to benchmark quality performance initially internally as organizations get used to the metric and how to use it and how to interpret it. And then ultimately, as again, as it matures and as data gets shared across the industry, we believe we can move to uh, benchmarking across the industry. Um, so that's, so in conclusion, we really think we've met our, our goals uh, in this research. But before we go on to questions, we just wanted to I just wanted to introduce you to all the organizations that participated uh, in this research. You can see it's uh, made up of contractors and owners. And I wanted to thank those organizations, not for their participation, but also for the individuals that they selected to participate. It was a very active group, and I must say a very passionate group about this subject. Um, everyone was a very active participant. Uh, participant, I think it's fair to say that their fingerprints, all of their fingerprints are all over this research. And I'll just leave you with this thought. Um, we're convinced that, again, with some use, with some uh, sharing of data, with maturing the processes, that this, this magazine cover is, is a real possibility at some point in our future. 
So with that, uh, we'll open it up for questions. Lights. Do we need the lights? Or? Hello, Eric Lambert, Zarek. Um, is it going to be a repository for CII members to um, put their data in so they can do that benchmarking that you discussed? Um, <clears throat> that, is, uh, that is something we've uh, uh, had preliminary, let's say not discussions, but suggestions provided to CII, but we really haven't had any detailed discussions about that or any decisions made relative to that. Although from our end, certainly would encourage. <laughs> if from our end, we would definitely encourage that. But uh, I can't speak for, uh, for CII. Okay, thanks. Nice work. Any other questions? Yes, uh, Kim Allen with CII. Uh, for your early adopters, how difficult was it to get management support to collect the data? And then secondly, did it add burden to the projects to do so? William, do you want to take that one? Yeah, uh, not at all. It, it showed um, a clear direction to an improving, as I mentioned, you know, our, we're all about process improvement, optimizing our business uh, uh, processes, and this was a no-brainer. Bra no it gave a lot more granularity, helped us standardize our results so we can actually com compare across the globe in, in a, a much more uh, directed fashion, uh, compare projects to each other, where that's a little bit of a gap of what we have right now. How do we compare a project in China to a project in Indianapolis? And this is helping us get there. So management was, it was a slam dunk for them. They supported it from the, uh, the, uh, the, the outset. Is it, you remind me of the question, the second question, or B? How difficult was collecting the data? What was that? How difficult was collecting the data? Oh, not onerous at all. It's, uh, I think our biggest thing is how do we uh, you know, show our project managers that it's not a punitive met uh, metrics that's going to go against their performance reviews, but rather a tool that they can just keep improving the quality of their product. So that's our, our probably was our biggest challenge, and even at that, any decent, you know, our, our, pro our project managers, you know, pretty solid individuals, and they, um, they, they're, they're, gonna, they're buying into this as, you know, progressively. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, we will uh, be outside uh, at 2.45, I believe, if anybody has any additional no. questions. There's one of our team members that uh, is silently sitting in the background, but is the one that keeps us aligned and in line and is a real big support to this team during the entire time. Kim Needy, she's over there. She can just wave. Yes. And I'd like to thank her a lot. She's from the University of Arkansas and uh, a huge part of our team. This is limited chairs, I guess, on the stage, but we thank her as well. So, so again, if there's any additional questions, we'll be outside at 2.45, and there's always the app. All right, thank you. Thank you.